Hello all, uh, thank you for uh, participating in this webinar. Uh, my name is Ryan Tamburino and I'm an orthodontist in practice in Princeton Junction, New Jersey and in Philadelphia. I um, have a background in biomedical and mechanical engineering from Duke University and also my DMD and orthodontics degrees from the University of Pennsylvania uh, where I've also stayed on uh, as a clinical associate. Uh, during this webinar, uh, we're going to talk about one topic that is actually my favorite to discuss, and that is transverse diagnosis. And we're going to take that diagnostic capability and move forward with a couple uh, modern appliances uh, using TAD-supported expansion, uh, which to me has been one of the real game changers uh, for me in my office. So uh, to get started today, uh, first, a couple of objectives uh, for this webinar, uh, which I think you'll find very uh, useful as we go through, is first, we want to understand our goals for obtaining transverse skeletal harmony. You know, a lot of what is done with the transverse is done just by looking or rough guessing. Uh, what we're going to try to accomplish through this webinar is to give you objective and measurable goals uh, for why we want to normalize the transverse dimension and also what benefits that that can have for our patients. Secondly, um, we're going to talk about a novel approach that we've been developing uh, to actually harmonize the width of the maxilla to the mandible. Now there are a couple different methods uh, that are out there. Uh, I will briefly talk about two of them. However, because of time constraints, uh, we'll just focus on uh, the CBCT approach uh, that we've been developing. And although all practitioners may not have access to CBCT, uh, the concepts for why it works uh, are what's going to be most important. Uh, and so that you can take that knowledge and apply it to your patients regardless uh, of the imaging capabilities that you have in your office. Third, uh, we're going to talk about protocols uh, for determining timing of and appliance selection for expansion. Uh, once again, there seems to be a lot of controversy and opinions on when and how uh, people should be treated and some things are best treated early, some things are best treated later. In the mode of talking about objective uh, criteria for expansion, uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about is protocols to help determine when should expansion be initiated uh, in order to get the most effective results and also the goals. And lastly, we'll talk about uh, TAD-supported expansion. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a somewhat novel and new uh, technique uh, in orthodontics. And for me, it has been one of the absolute game changers for me in terms of uh, expanding my treatment abilities uh, for older adolescents. And of course, once we are done talking about that, um, that certainly wouldn't be complete without discussing how we can easily incorporate this both um, effectively and efficiently uh, into your own office so that you can begin doing this tomorrow. So the point of this whole webinar is basically to either reinforce or expand our knowledge. And you know, John Maxwell had kind of said it best uh, for what we all do in our offices every day. And you know, when you look at his quote, he says, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's very important. It's, you know, the, one of the best things that we have with our profession is that we can care for our patients and show them that we care. But behind that care, we have to also have that knowledge to be able to confidently tell them that what we are going to do for them is going to be in their best interest. And ultimately, they're the ones that benefit. So, you know, everything that we're going to talk about today, not only is it going to benefit the practitioner to make sure that, you know, your office is running as efficiently and as effectively as possible, but ultimately so that we have the best outcome for all of our patients. And I think that's everybody's goal. So this webinar series is part of the Complete Clinical Orthodontics series um, via GCARE and sponsored by Dentsply GAC. And the point of the CCO is really to focus back on diagnostics and really helping you get efficient and effective treatment for your patients. So I hope that you will, you will find that by the time we're done with this webinar today. So when we're looking at all of our patients, 
just a routine case that has walked into the office. You know, this is kind of what we're looking at. You know, and when we do our initial exams on patients and we take them through the whole process to the finish, there's a lot of steps that we have to really kind of take into account. But the one part that we cannot forget is that people are more than just teeth. One patient, okay, is not just teeth itself. There are actually 28 of them, plus all the muscles, the jaws, the joints, the periodontium, and the airway all have to work together uh, as a system in order for us to have the most effective results. And we can't really ignore one component or the other or focus only on one component or the other because ultimately something is going to break down. So we have to always keep this in mind, even though today we're just going to be talking about really just the jaws and specifically the jaws just in the transverse dimension. So when in order we have to do this, we have to think about what, what are we hoping to achieve. And unless we can fully envision what our final result looks like, it's going to be really hard for us to take the initial patient and move them towards that final result. So we always have to be, be able to think, what is my end result supposed to look like? How do we begin with the end in our mind? And once we do that, now we can start thinking about the path uh, for success in order to obtain those results for our patients. So treatment goals. Okay, this is the fundamental aspect of, I think, the entire orthodontics as a specialty. We need to understand for the face, the airway, the jaws, the gums, the teeth. What are our goals? What are we trying to achieve? And when we're looking at all these components, the only way to really understand, you know, what are we trying to achieve is to be able to look at final results and look at initial results and say, well, okay, if I'm going to look at all these other areas, why is this what I want? So in my mind, goals have to be universal, objective, and quantifiable. Universal meaning they have to apply to everybody. So people have to look good. Um, the teeth need to function correctly. They need to be free, free of discomfort. Objective. Basically, we can't just say, well, I think. You know, there has to be something that we're trying to shoot for to say, this is how I know I've achieved my goal or I haven't. And to that end, then quantifiable. So if something doesn't meet your goal, how far away is it from the goal? What do I have to do to get there? Um, these are Once you take into account all of these things, um, treatment becomes very, very obvious to, to the practitioner. So for us, um, with the CCO, we're using a diagnostic sheet uh, that helps us sort all this data for our patients. Um, However, the question that we're going to talk about today is, does the patient require expansion? And so we're going to really only focus on the transverse diagnosis part of this sheet. So in light with our goals um, being universal, objective, and quantifiable, it's hard to objectify a result or objectify a treatment uh, without having a diagnostic reference for what you're trying to achieve. And the transverse dimension is no different. So what are the goals? Okay, so if I'm looking at this cross-sectional cut, okay, what are we looking at? Well, to me, this is basically the ideal objective for the posterior dental relationships and, and a final result. So the teeth are centered in the alveolus, teeth are upright in the alveolus, and also they're well intercuspated. So these are our three goals for what we want to achieve. And for me, this is important uh, for the function of the dentition, stability of the dentition, because teeth that are well intercuspated and interlocked help to stabilize themselves, um, health of the joints, and viability of the periodontia. Now, we're not going to be able to get into all of those today, but into thinking about global objectives for why we're trying to do this, these would be my four uh, reasons for why I'm looking to get the transverse normalized. So when we look at a situation like that, and we compare it to one such as this, okay, which is a very common presentation for many of our patients, once we normalize those posterior relationships, well, you can imagine that non-working interferences are going to be minimized. Centric prematurities and functional shifts are minimized. 
And now we have vertical force vectors of mastication directed down the long axis of the tooth. But in order to really have those goals and objectives and outcomes, once again, we need a reference position. And the first thing that needs to be understood and that needs to be realized before we can really move forward is that, for the most part, the width of the mandibular basal bone is genetically determined. Um, the research has shown and my experience has shown that, you know, I can't really change the basal bone dimensions of the mandible. I can't change it in the width. I can't change it um, in the sagittal direction. So basically this part is genetically determined. And routine treatment isn't really going to affect the dimensions of the lower jaw. So our objective with doing this webinar is going to be, all right, well, how do we get that upper jaw now to fit with our lower, which is the reference position? Now, you may say, well, okay, sometimes, you know, you can certainly do surgical with modification, but that's a special case and not one that's going to be the typical routine case that comes into the office. So we're not going to focus on what happens if we modify the width of the mandible surgically. We're basically just going to look at if there's a normal patient that comes in, what do we do to make that upper jaw properly fit the lower jaw, assuming that the lower jaw is not able to be changed with routine treatment. So the other thing to really remember, and if you think of the four uh, reasons why I was talking about normalizing the transverse dimension, not once did I ever say um, it's because so we can make room for teeth. Certainly that is one of the, should I say, side effects or uh, consequences of expansion, but that is not the objective. So at the end of this webinar, if you can only remember this one slide, this will be the critical part of this whole session. Rapid palate expansion, at least on its own, has nothing to do with gaining arch perimeter or whether we have to do the extraction, non-extraction decision. The point of what we are talking about is optimizing the skeletal transverse relationship between the maxilla and the mandible. Now, as I had mentioned, certainly when you expand an upper jaw, you do gain space and that will accommodate more teeth. However, this, is, this part of how much space you gain has to then be factored independently into your space analysis to determine that with your other goals, if extraction or non-extraction is appropriate for that patient. Remember, extraction and non-extraction is a treatment plan. It is not a treatment goal. Okay? It helps you get your treatment goals. So when we're looking at reference positions, Okay, the first thing we have to do, if the mandible is not going to change and our mandible is our reference position for the maxilla, we have to think about, well, how, where is the position of the mandibular teeth supposed to be? So for this, um, being an engineer, I really like this article by uh, Katona that was back in the AJO in 2009, and he talks about the center of resistance. And basically his definition was that this is the point at which a tooth rotates in response to the moment of a couple. So, in other words, if this tooth is at an improper inclination, as it uprights, the center of resistance is going to be that point at which that tooth rotates. Okay, so if, as we're trying to upright those teeth to get them upright and centered in the bone, the center of resistance is going to be the point at which that happens. And if you're looking at mandibular teeth, you know, the analysis that he wrote in that article says it's going to be roughly near the furcation area of the mandibular molar. Now, as we, as we move forward with that train of thought, also with that article, it said the center of resistance of those molars is basically going to correlate roughly with the height of the mucogingival junction. So now, if you start look, to look at the mucogingival junction, while we can't precisely see the center of resistance of the teeth, we can see the mucogingival junction very readily inside the mouth. So if we think about what does that mean? Okay, so if we're looking at the mucogingival junction, basically anything coronal to that is going to be the alveolar bone. And this part is something that we can modify with conventional orthodontic treatment. So just by putting on brackets and wires, we have the ability 
as we tip this tooth buccalier lingually to you know change the the anatomy of this section of the jaw. However, if we look at anything apical to the mucogingival junction, this is what we're talking about in terms of the skeletal base uh, that is basically genetically determined that we don't have the ability to modify uh, with routine orthodontics. So if you look also at the anatomy of the lower jaw, you can see that based on the shape uh, in cross-section, if we say that the bone apical to the mucogingival junction cannot be changed, then this, because this tapers, is going to essentially represent the narrowest and most coronal portion of the mandibular skeletal base. So since we cannot necessarily change that to any appreciable degree uh, with routine orthodontic treatment, that's going to basically be our reference position for the width of the lower jaw. So if we start to look at landmarks of what has been done in the past, um, Ricketts back in the 60s uh, talked about using the frontal ceph to look at skeletal landmarks. And for the maxilla, he used MXMX, which was the depth of the concavity. But for the mandible, he had used AGAG, which is the anagonial notch. And while that was great for its time, um, you know, when we had this, the frontal ceph, as our only image or only method to measure the width of the upper and the lower jaw, it was definitely better than not doing anything at all. However, if we start to look at the shape of the lower jaws, and now that we have three-dimensional imaging capability, we can, we can go back and revisit these landmarks and say, okay, well, in three dimensions, this is where MXMX is. And, you know, I would agree that this correlates really well with the base of the upper jaw. Okay. But if we flip that thought around and we look at the mandibular skeletal base based on the mucogingival junction that we just talked about, this is kind of going to be where we're looking at right here. But when we're looking at the, the AGAG, this is really where we're measuring. So in the frontal plane, this looks very reasonable. But if you look here in the sagittal, AG is really far removed um, from the mandibular skeletal base. So while this was great for its time, the problems that at least I start to see with AGAG are that we may not be able to really to tell the true skeletal discrepancy because AG is actually a 2D projection of a 3D location. The anatomy of patients' external oblique ridge is variable. So even though the actual dentition and the base of the dentition may not change, this, this part out here by the external oblique ridge can, be, can vary from person to person. So, and also, this is very far removed from the dental base. Unlike MXMX, which is really close to the dental base, AGAG is somewhat far away. And while MX correlates well with the position of the first molar, AG really doesn't correlate with anything. So it's really, uh, it's really difficult to have a good relationship between these two. So back to the mandibular reference position using the mucogingival junction. This is something that we can readily see in the mouth. And as was shown from the Katona article, this represents also our, the level of the horizontal center of resistance of the teeth. So once we have this reference position, we can start looking at the teeth now and saying, well, how did the teeth relate to this position? So another article in the AJO by Rone looked at the dif difference between the mucogingival junction and the FA point of the mandibular first molar. And they said in their article it was somewhere between 2 to 3 millimeters. Okay. And also that this was determined to be representative of the bony apical base in order to determine arch form. So very similar to what we were talking about as the most coronal portion of the, of the uh, skeletal base of the, ma the mandible. 
This article is also reinforcing that that is a viable position to determine the bony apical base of the mandible. So once we have our mandibular reference position and we know how the FA point of the tooth, which is the center of the clinical crown, relates to that mucogingival junction, we can start formulating a relationship between the two in an ideal situation. So if we look at this cartoon, which to me represents our treatment goals of upright, centered, and well intercuspated, assuming there's a maxillary tooth there, the ideally inclined mandibular first molar distance between the FA point and the mucogingival junction is going to be somewhere between 2 to 3 millimeters. And that's going to correlate with our center resistance of our tooth and the, the base of the mandible in order to determine uh, our reference position. Now, the, the thing about this that is really intriguing is that as this distance starts to change, and if we start thinking about our goals of upright, centered, and well intercuspated, now that when we put a maxillary tooth uh, in that position, if we look at this relationship of mucogingival junction to FA being 2 to 3 millimeters, and that tooth is upright and centered, well then this is how the maxillary tooth has to fit with it. In situations where that distance becomes greater, that means the lower tooth now is lingually inclined, and this often is what suggests a skeletal transverse uh, issue with the maxilla because now the upper tooth must lean buccally in order to properly fit with this. So now we're against our goals of upright, centered, and well intercuspated. Uh, we, have, we have the well intercuspated part, but it's being masked because those teeth are now lingually inclined and not centered. Okay, so when this distance becomes greater, this is when we can start to suspect that there are transverse discrepancies. Now, in a rarer situation, say where an upper jaw is too wide or there is a syndrome in the, in the mandible, now sometimes we'll have the reverse situation uh, where now the upper tooth is lingually inclined. Uh, but this is more rare. Uh, the most common presentation that you will see is this type of situation with the teeth not in crossbite. Okay, so even though the teeth are not in crossbite, there is a skeletal crossbite and the teeth are trying to camouflage that discrepancy. So when we start looking at this, we're going to use the number two and a half millimeters. Now what does that, what does that really mean? Well, if we kind of take a look at anatomy, like I said, this is not anything scientific, this is strictly looking at anatomy. We can see that when the teeth are upright, centered, and well intercuspated, that distance between the cusp to fossa is going to be roughly 2.5 millimeters just by anatomy. And it so happens that when you have that relationship, the horizontal distance between the mucogingival junction and MX is also roughly 2.5 millimeters in an ideal situation, which we will get into in a few slides. But for right now, let's just focus on this distance which is roughly two and a half millimeters. So once again, this is just anatomy. There is nothing magical here. This is just looking at the anatomical relationship of teeth when they are upright, centered, and well intercuspated. So when we take this relationship between the teeth and also mucogingival junction and MX to be about two and a half millimeters aside, and we put that into the entire jaw, This would basically say that if our teeth are going to be optimally positioned in the alveolus, upright, centered, and well intercuspated, our maxilla needs to be 5 millimeters wider than the mandible in the, in the bony dimension in order to have the teeth accommodate this position. Now, I'm going to say that again. This is 5 millimeters wider in the bones. It has nothing to do with teeth. Uh, teeth being in crossbite, teeth not being in crossbite. We're strictly talking about the dimensions of the bones in order to get the teeth upright, centered, and well intercuspated. So this is kind of what we're looking at. So if we look at this type of situation, this is exactly where I was talking about the distance between the mucogingival junction and the FA point is going to be greater than 2 to 3 millimeters. 
and you will see this presentation so often in your patients. The teeth are not in crossbite, but the lower molars are very lingually inclined and the upper molars are buccally inclined. The point of expansion in these cases is to be able to now normalize the width of the upper jaw so that we can achieve that upright, centered, and well intercuspated position without causing any damage to the periodontium. So once again, taking our patients from here and through palatal expansion, normalizing the bones in order to get the teeth to fit properly together. So if we don't expand that type of case, okay, of course there are consequences. Now, it's not saying they're going to happen in every case, but there is certainly risk uh, for things that can happen if the transverse dimension discrepancy is too great and we just put on brackets and wires and say, well, we're just going to correct the teeth normally. First is we can put on brackets and wires and just basically tip the teeth. Okay, so, you know, the teeth, the palatal cusp is still in the fossa, but the teeth have been tipped. So you can imagine that in situations where the patient then goes into excursive movements, you're now going to have a non-working interference. And this is, for me, this is one of the major causes of these non-working interferences. It's not due to the, the prescription in the bracket, per se. It's due to the fact that the, the arch is not normal, and the teeth just have no physical way to be uprighted and torqued to still be in a normal relationship without fenestrating the roots. And you can imagine that there's going to be an excessive curve of Wilson, and non-working interferences are certainly likely in these cases. Now, this was a case where this was done. And you can see um, that there was expansion done with just arch wires. And when this came into our, our office and we took, we took records, this is what we saw. So you can certainly see the excessive cur cur curve of Wilson and what is often referred to as plunging palatal cusps in this situation. So let's say that you don't tip the teeth and you do, you know, level the curve of Wilson. Okay, well, you can certainly do that and get those teeth, you know, well intercuspated and upright. But when that's the case, they're not going to be centered in the alveolus. Now, we will get into there are certain limits that we can do and certain boundaries that we have. But if this discrepancy is too great and we try to do this, you may not see an intermediate or an immediate problem uh, with the dentition. However, by doing this dental expansion in the presence of a skeletal discrepancy that is too great, what happens is this can cause thinning of the cortical plate and now the buccal gingival unit. So oftentimes, you know, people will come in with recession on their posterior teeth and, you know, it said, oh, well, you're just brushing too hard. They could be, that's certainly one cause, but another cause could be that in the past they just had their teeth lined up, but now because the attachment on the buckle of those posterior teeth has been thinned, it's now more susceptible to being eroded and abraded just through normal mechanical forces. And this can lead the, pa this can lead the patient susceptible to periodontal issues in the long term, not necessarily something that you're going to see immediately. And this was highlighted uh, in an article by Anzalotti and, and Benarsdale. And he said, a transverse differential of greater than 5 millimeters may be a risk marker for periodontal disease and gingival recession. It took me a long time to really understand what that statement meant uh, when I was going through my training. But this is basically what I had just talked about. When the upper jaw is too narrow and we try to get normal uh, dental relationships on a skeletal base that is not normal, we, are, we could leave the teeth at greater risk for periodontal problems in the future, such as this case shown below, which was a 26-year-old dental student uh, who had had a history of orthodontic treatment. Uh, but you can see on the posterior teeth, there is a skeletal transverse uh, discrepancy. And you can see that just through brackets and wires, how the teeth were uprighted, but now the gingival unit was thinned, so that just with normal brushing, um, there was recession-induced. Now, these teeth are spotless, okay? Like I said, this is a dental student. There is no, no plaque on these teeth. There is absolutely no inflammation. So this is, not, this is not actively induced periodontal disease. This is mechanical abrasion of these teeth through compromised periodontia.
Now, in very severe cases, if we try to get a normal relationship, you know, we do have that capability to somehow fenestrate the roots. Uh, if we truly ignore um, what's going on and try to get a normal relationship um, in the presence of a severe discrepancy. So I hope that no one would attempt these kind of cases, but in, the, in these certain situations, this is possible. You know, just through expanding with arch wires, and what you can see here on the cross section is a severe transverse discrepancy. You know, we certainly have the, the ability to do damage, uh, but like I said, I hope that we are not going to, we are not going to do that as practitioners today. So now that we've talked about our goals and for and talked about you know what we're looking for in terms of how uh, our upper and lower jaw fit and why we want our upper and lower jaw to fit um, fit that way, we need to diagnose it. Just like we diagnose the sagittal, just like we know, diagnose the vertical, just like we diagnose the teeth, we need to have an objective, quantifiable diagnosis of the transverse dimension. So one of, the, one of the analyses that we've been working on uh, over the past couple years, as I mentioned, is using these goals to really look at the relationship of upper and lower jaws um, on a CBCT cross-sections. And as I mentioned, on our diagnostic sheet, uh, we have two methods that I actually use to measure the, di the transverse. I use the CBCT method. And there's also a method uh, which, which was developed by um, Dr. Andrews, and we, had, and we had modified it slightly, to use the dental casts, which will achieve the same information. Unfortunately, because of lack of time, uh, we cannot get into both. Uh, but in our office, we actually do use both uh, on every single patient. And this provides a way for us to actually double check our measurements and make sure uh, that we are truly uh, quantifying and accurately measuring um, any transverse discrepancy. What has been shown as well uh, it was, uh, with the second article is that we compared um, transverse diagnostic measurements and the difference between the dental cast method here and the CBCT method was always within one or two millimeters of each other. So, you know, while that may be statistically significant, Clinically, uh, there really did, there was not much significance, so we feel confident that we can use either method and still um, get a reasonable diagnosis for our patients. So for right now, this is what we're going to focus on. And this is based on partly what we talked about from the, the Ricketts analysis, as well as talking about the mucogingival junction. So back to our reference position. Okay. We said that the center of resistance, which is that point at which that tooth rotates, is going to correlate very well with the height of the mucogingival junction. And when we're looking at our cross sections, we already said that MX correlates very well with the maxillary skeletal base. And now we're going to use our mucogingival junction as our reference position for the mandibular skeletal base. Now, if you look at this, you may say, well, Okay, well, if we're going to talk about the mandibular skeletal base being with the center of resistance of the lower teeth, MX does not correlate with the center of resistance of the upper teeth, and that is true. But if you look at how the zygomatic buttress forms, you can see that for the most part, the dimension here is going to be pretty close to the same dimension here, and MX is very easily identifiable. Also, as you start seeing cross-sections, you will see people that have a long-standing transverse discrepancy have bony exostoses. So the jaw will come along here through MX, and then you'll have this exostosis of bone out here. Well, that's good, but the apex still does not have that bone as protection. So once again, this is going to measure our minimal width of the maxillary skeletal base. This is going to be our minimal width of the mandibular skeletal base so that we don't over or underestimate what the transverse uh, discrepancy is or the, what the need is. So if we're looking at a cone beam of patients, okay, we have to remember that the, with the cone beam imaging, we have the ability to look at a patient in three dimensions, and everything is going to be exactly one-to-one. -one. So I'm going to back up for one second. Okay? Now, the case that we're going to use for the example Okay, of teeth upright, centered, 
and well intercuspated. When we came to determine what this relationship is, we took cases that were like this. Now this was an untreated case that when we looked at the cross sections, we can see that both the maxillary and mandibular teeth are upright, centered, and well intercuspated. So that's why we wanted to determine, well, okay, how in these cases, uh, when they look normal and they look like they appear uh, to the goals that we're trying to shoot for, what is the relationship between the upper and the lower jaw? So in order to do this, what we did is we measured on the axial slice where the coronal cut intersects MXMX. So basically, we looked at the frontal cut and we scrolled up to the level of MXMX. And then we went to the axial cut and then we measured this distance. So in this patient, it measured 60 millimeters. And the reason for doing this is going to become apparent now when we start looking at the mandible. Because yes, of course, you can certainly look at the frontal cut and measure this. You don't need to do this on the axial cut for the maxilla. But when we look at the mandible and we go through our furcation, which is now our center of resistance, uh, which is going to correlate to our mucogingival junction, we look at our axial slice and we measure. And on this patient, it happened to be 55. So if we're looking at MXMX, mucogingival junction, mucogingival junction, on this patient, which is untreated, where the teeth are upright in the bone, centered in the bone, and well intercuspated, a maxilla measures 60, a mandible measures 55 for a difference of 5 millimeters. Now, if you think back a couple slides, when we talked about anatomy, being that cusp to cusp or fossa distance of two and a half millimeters aside and saying that the upper jaw then should be five millimeters wider than the lower, this comes to be again. So if we're looking at the maxilla at MXMX, mandible at the mucogingival junction, in an ideal situation where the teeth are upright, centered, and well intercuspated, the maxilla was five millimeters wider than the lower. And as we started going through this with 10, 15 cases um, that we saw these untreated samples that looked like this, they all measured right around five millimeters of difference, plus or minus a quarter to a half millimeter. So as an objective measurement, as something that is quantifiable, our goal then is to get our upper jaw five millimeters wider than the lower in order to have those teeth, again, upright, centered, and well intercuspated. Now, the reason that we used the axial cut uh, on this. And when we put this in our diagnostic sheet, um, you can see that there is zero millimeters of expansion required. But the reason for the axial cut is that if you look at the frontal cut here, you have to remember that the mandible is tapered. So if we're going to take a vertical slice through a tapered mandible, this width of the cortical bone is going to be distorted. So even though this is the dimension width of the cortical bone, it looks much thicker on the frontal cut than it does on the axial cut. So in order to pre prevent any, any false measurements, this is the reason that we use the axial cut when we use the CBCT analysis. So taking this into, into, into B now, into a clinical situation. Okay, so all of that theory, what does that mean for you? Now, like I said, we have the ability uh, to use CBCT, but not, not every practitioner is going to have that in their office. So what can we kind of take, take away from that first part when we talked about the theory? Well, let's look at this case. Okay, so we can see on the frontal cut and we can see on the intraoral image. Now we see canines that are, that are ectopic. Uh, we see no crossbite uh, in the posterior teeth. So, you know, there are a lot of people that I would suspect that I have shown this case to that said, okay, well, we need to extract teeth because there's not enough room, um, or we need to expand the teeth to make room. Well, let's take a look at this. Let's measure her maxilla. Her maxilla is 58. Her mandible is 60 for a difference of minus 2 millimeters. If our goal is to have our upper jaw 
five millimeters wider than our lower, that would basically mean that she's going to need seven millimeters of expansion. Now, there are a lot of people that would say that, oh, that's not, that's not needed. Well, if you take a look at our reference position of the mucogingival junction, look at the inclination of those lower molars, camouflaging the fact that the upper jaw is way too narrow for the lower. So this is something that you can all see clinically. Like you said, you don't even, you, you know, it's, you have to do a measurement to determine how much expansion, but you can at least have a thought or a suspicion that there may be an underlying expansion need on the case just by looking in the mouth. And if you see this extreme inclination of the lower posterior teeth, you can likely suspect that when you do measure, the upper jaw is going to be much too narrow for the lower. But then when you measure, you determine how much is actually needed. So, let's take a look at another case. Now, here's a case that is in crossbite. All right, now, you would say, well, okay, if I showed you a case that was in crossbite and a case that wasn't in crossbite, you would say, well, the case in crossbite, you know, needs more expansion because, oh, that we need to correct the crossbite. Well, in this case, actually, the expansion need was only six millimeters. So, you know, this is the point of doing an objective diagnosis is that every case is different and every case their their control and their reference position is their own mandible you can't really just project this onto every patient that walks in the door you have to treat everybody as an individual and make everybody's individual maxilla match their lower based on their individual need and if you take a look at this case now this is an adult but just imagine it's a teenager now with ectopic canines once again, you know, a lot, of, a lot of traditional thought would be, okay, we need to expand the upper jaw now to make room for those canines to come in so we don't have to take out teeth. Well, if you look at the cross section, you can see that those teeth are already upright and they're actually pressed against the buccal cortical plate. So with this expansion need of two millimeters, for me, that's clinically to the point where I'm not going to do any expansion. And we would take what's an otherwise normal posterior transverse relationship where those teeth are upright already and now if we expanded this now we would go into that situation where now the lower teeth have to be uprighted and the upper teeth leaned in so this is an example of what would be an extraction case there is this this is a case where expansion would actually harm the patient and leave them in a worse off situation because the jaws are itself normal okay but we don't know this unless we have our goals of what we're looking for, upright, centered, and well intercuspated, as well as our reference position, which is the mucogingival junction and MXMX, and we're able to quantify how much change is actually going to be needed to take the patient from their initial presentation to our goal of what we're looking for. So, that's kind of the recap for the theoretical portion of the webinar in terms of just helping you understand how our teeth supposed to fit together and what are we looking at when we look in the mouth and we can get a suspicion of when a transverse discrepancy is there and then we can measure for it. And now the next part that we're going to talk about is, okay, what do we do about it? So, when we need to correct the transverse discrepancy, obviously we're going to use palatal expansion. Okay, uh, one of the now areas of research that we're looking at and one of the areas of interest for us is trying to say, well, why do some studies show that palatal expansion has effect, uh, is very effective? Why are some saying it's not? Why is some expander types give you dental tipping. Why do some not? And there's a lot of back and forth in the literature and in just clinical practice in terms of what exactly are we trying to do uh, with palatal expansion for our patients. So when we're looking at our mandibular reference position, okay, the reason that this can work for growing patients is that, once again, they are their own control and we're trying to get our upper jaw to match our lower jaw. Uh, there was a study that we did um, a couple years ago that showed that even as patients grow, that mucogingival junction, the mucogingival junction distance, increased roughly two hundredths of a millimeter a year of growth. 
between the ages of 6 and 18. So once again, while that may be clinically or statistically significant in research projects, to me, that change that's going to happen over that period of time is not going to be really clinically significant to alter my decision. So if we just let people grow, what does grow is the anagonial notch. So that part is variable. But what was shown uh, looking at casts at the growth center is that the actual housing of the teeth does not really change that much as patients grow. Now, we have shown that with intervention and possibly using lip bumpers, that we may be able to alter that, that distance. But the point was that right now there, it's, it's just not known as how much we can change this dimension on a predictable basis um, in order to, you know, really say, well, okay, I'm going to take our patient, which is now eight years old, and we're going to be able to get two, three, four millimeters of change, more so than growth, uh, by the time they're actually ready for braces. However, for me, though, it still does not affect the maxillary expansion decision, which, when we go through these protocols in a couple slides, I think you'll understand why. So even though we may have the ability to change this, to me, it still is not clinically significant. So when we're looking at expansion, you know, the previous thinking and, you know, the way that has really been done is saying that, okay, well, the earlier a patient is expanded, it's going to be more effective, it's better tolerated because the suture is not as fused, and it's going to be more stable. So effective meaning that there's going to be more skeletal change and less dental tipping because the dental tipping, as we know, will relapse, but the skeletal change will be stable. And this earlier was basically used on this patient's skeletal age with a hand wrist radiograph. So we were able to look at a hand wrist radiograph and say, well, okay, patient may be 10 years old, but their skeletal age may be 8, it may be 12, or we may have some adolescents that are actually a skeletal age of an adult. And looking at these hand wrist films, we can look at, at the growth plates and say, well, are the growth plates still open? And how mature, immature is the skeleton of can we expand them? Well, what, an article that just came out this year in the AJO um, may actually shed a little bit more light onto this because, you know, there's been a lot of reports um, on adult expansion um, and things that may, you know, typically may go against, against the conventional way of thought. And this article by Angelera was talking about it's not necessarily the skeletal age maturity of the patient, but actually looking at the maturity of the suture itself. Because what they were showing was that there are some patients where the suture actually remains patent even long after adolescence. And these may be the cases that we're talking about with case reports of seeing expansion done conventionally, meaning non-surgically, in adults. So when you looked at this article, they were looking at cone beam sections of saying, well, what does the anatomy of the suture look like? And then being able to classify the patient into these certain stages. And through that, what they were able to say was that, well, okay, when you see definitive split, uh, between the halves of the maxilla, this is what you know you typically see in your eight, nine, ten, eleven year old. Um, you know these are easily done non-surgical expansion. As the kids start to mature, well, you know this stage where there is still some immaturity of the suture can linger um, long into late adolescence and early adulthood. So you know these type of patients may have that ability to be expanded effectively much later than what you would typically think and then as the suture then starts to fuse or in some cases doesn't fuse these are cases when still surgical expansion um, and intervention may be needed but this gives a much better and to me a more quantifiable uh, method of looking at directly at the maxillary suture as opposed to trying to infer what's going on with the maxillary suture by looking at a hand wrist film or another method of saying skeletal maturity. So while this is still young, um, I think this research is going to start showing promise in terms of really being able to determine when expansion is still going to be uh, possible and effective. So now we're starting to think of 
current thinking. Um, my, my thought process on expansion is starting to change. So now I'm starting to think, well, maybe the effectiveness of the bony expansion that we're going to get on our patients is going to be based on not only the amount of expansion needed, which is what we talked about previously in terms of quantifying, but now it's going to be based on sutural maturity as opposed to skeletal maturity. The next aspect that we're looking at right now is vertical placement of the jack screw. Uh, this, I think, is, uh, is also going to play a big role in determining how much uh, expansion can we achieve and especially how effective uh, can we achieve our expansion. So if we look at this study um, that was done in the AJO as well, they showed uh, finite element uh, simulations of where the stresses were being placed uh, based on the height of the expansion screw. And what was shown was that the lower the expansion screw was placed, the more stresses showed up in the teeth. And as the screw was placed higher and higher and higher, you can start to see the stresses being placed at the apex of the teeth, which for me now translates to the bone. So if you think about expansion, okay, there we talked about center of resistance of the mandibular teeth, you know, and how that and what that means, and that's the point at where teeth rotate. Well, there's there is a center of resistance somewhere of this upper jaw because we know as expansion happens, it does not happen in perfect separation. It happens in a triangle based on that pivot point of that center of resistance somewhere up here. Okay, we're not exactly sure where it is, but it is somewhere apical to the suture. So if this is where our suture is, okay, and this is where our expansion force is applied, it would seem that as we moved that expansion distance, which is here, okay, if we expanded this much, if we started moving that closer to the suture, we could expand the same amount, but the actual change at the level of the suture would be more the closer that we were to the suture. So if we have to imagine that expansion happens in a triangular fashion, the closer we are to the suture, the more we can expand the same amount, but get more sutural change versus dental tipping. So this is something that's been kind of intriguing towards us in a current project that we are, we are working on at the University of Pennsylvania. But as an example, if we look at this case, okay, this is a 13-year-old boy uh, that needs 9 millimeters of expansion. Okay? And so what we did is that we fabricated an appliance and we basically fabricated this with the jack screw directly onto the pallet. So there is so it is as high up as possibly can can be done. And we looked at what did we do? So if we look at the post expansion result and we really see well okay this was as high as we could make it because this is all palatal mucosa in here. What effect does varying this jack screw distance to the maxillary suture have on the amount of expansion that could be done. So now this is a 13-year-old boy with a tooth-borne expander that you would expect with conventional thoughts to say that, hey, there's going to be a lot of dental tipping and not a lot of sutural change. However, if you look um, at the image, you can see there was plenty of sutural split. And you can see that when his, his pretreatment measure was around 58 millimeters, his post-expansion measurement was around 62. So what we were able to see was that, hey, you know what? With an 8 millimeter screw, if we put it as close as possible, what we're seeing is we're getting about roughly 50% of that into our skeletal change. And our skeletal change, once again, that's our objective. And if you look at the pre and the post, you can see there's very little dental tipping, uh, but there was a lot of sutural change. And to kind of even reinforce that even more, if we look at that case of the 13-year-old boy where that screw was as high up as possible, and now we compare that to the case of an 8-year-old boy where the screw is much, much lower, these were both 8-millimeter expansion screws. And look at the ch sutural change of a 13-year-old versus the 18-year-old. 
and look at the dental tipping that happened in the 8-year-old versus the 13-year-old. So this really kind of goes across conventional wisdom of expansion, saying that, okay, well, you would think that the 8-year-old would have more skeletal change versus dental tipping, and you would have, you know, very effective expansion on the 8-year-old. But that's not really the case. So think about it also. You know, when the screw is here, there is the center of resistance of these teeth, and these teeth are able to tip a lot easier than the center of resistance of the entire jaw. So this low screw can easily cause these teeth to tip, whereas this high screw, which is now above the center of resistance of the teeth, actually prevents tooth tipping and encourages more sutural expansion. So this is something to think, think about later. And one thing that we're starting to say is that, hey, you know, I think maybe the higher you place the screw, based on the FEA studies and what we are seeing clinically, certainly can have more effective expansion even on older kids. So that is the third part of the current thinking, is that vertical placement of the screw as high as possible in the palate can certainly improve the expansion effectiveness. The last part is the appla expansion appliance selection. So for me, based on measuring pre and post expansion results, uh, with the types of expanders I use, for what I just showed, with a bonded RPE, based on, these, based on what I just showed you, I can get somewhere close to 30 to 50 percent of the screw activation expressed in the bone. Once again, the bone is what my goal is. Looking at TAD-supported expansions, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, um, we're actually seeing even more, about 70 to 80 percent of the activation expressed at the MXMX level at the bone. And like I said, with our goal being sutural expansion, knowing how much I can get out of each expansion type at the level of the bones is what's important to me. So we talked about we don't want too much dental tipping, okay? And we don't, we don't want to thin the alveolus, and we don't want to thin the gingival unit. So for me, the transverse discrepancy I feel comfortable with is about a millimeter and a half of tooth movement on each side. So anything where the discrepancy is less than three millimeters, I feel very fine doing the rest with dental expansion and still be able to achieve uh, the ideal result in the posterior teeth without compromising the gingiva. So to this end, we started to develop protocols uh, based on what we see uh, on skeletal maturity, immaturity, or in adult patients. So when we're looking at skeletally immature adolescents, now these would be patients that you know typically be 8, 9, 10, 11 years old. If we do the measurement and we see that the discrepancy is between 4 to 6 millimeters, to us this is one phase treatment. You know, I know I can easily get that amount of change that I need to get under that 3 millimeter mark uh, with use, just using a conventional RPE right before braces and putting the screw as high up as possible. You know, I feel very comfortable saying that if there's a 6 millimeter discrepancy, I can get 3 millimeters of change right before I put braces on. When we start to gain more discrepancy in the 6 to 9 millimeter range, okay, if I use an 8 millimeter screw and I can only get 3 to 4 millimeters of sutural change with one expander, I know I'm not going to achieve my goal of being less than 3 millimeters. So this is where I see the advantage of two-phase treatment, meaning we do one expander now to get some of that dimension, and then we use a second expander right before bracketing to gain the rest of it. Now, that's just saying if it's needed. So obviously, any time we do two-phase treatment, you always take progress records before you do the second phase, and if you find out they need more expansion, you do it. This also goes wide to saying that if we use a lip bumper to now upright the teeth, which were lingually inclined uh, prior to the first expander, and we do happen to gain bony change, we'll just remeasure, and if we need to, then we'll re-expand. So that's why I said it's not really clinically significant to me whether or not we can get a lip bumper uh, to have bony change in the mandible, because I'm going to remeasure and re-expand as needed if that does happen. For cases that are greater than 9 millimeters, uh, once again, this to me qualifies as two-phase treatment with one or more RPEs early and then doing the second one bracketing. Oftentimes in these severe, severe, severe cases, we can't get a screw as high up in the palate as possible, so we have to do 
a lower screw, and that's going to give us more dental tipping, but it might expand the palate just enough so that now we can do a second expander and get the screw up where we need to and get the bony change that we're looking for. Okay, for skeletally mature adolescents. Okay, once again, four to six millimeters, to me, this is something I can start with a conventional or TAD RPE right before bracketing, and I know I can get the change that I need. This group right here is where the TAD supported RPE changed my practice. Okay, so for these kids that need six to nine millimeters of expansion, I know that I could not achieve that with a conventional RPE without having some surgical assistance. Um, to me, this is where the TAD supported RPE and knowing that on these skeletally mature adolescents, I can gain 70 to 80% of that dimension without surgery. Uh, this is one of the things that has truly, truly changed my practice and where I feel the TAD supported RPE is very, very beneficial. For kids that are greater than nine millimeters, um, sometimes I still think a SARP is indicated and now I'm using a TAD supported RPEs for all the SARPs just to be able to have less bulk in the mouth. Um, this is still, this is once again, this is a diagnostic decision, uh, whether the case is a SARP, whether it's a multiple stage surgery, uh, but we're talking about severe, severe skeletal, um, skeletal problems in those type of cases. This is going to be one of the most common cases that you're going to see is the 12, 13, 14, 15 year old that once you start measuring is going to need six to nine millimeters of expansion and now can very easily be um, corrected with using a TAD supported RP before you bracket the case. For an adult, anything less than four to six millimeters, you know, you know, obviously I say, well, hey, you know, we may need to put some gingiva on the buccal segments when cases are done, um, but, you know, we still cannot predictably expand an adult patient. The research that I just talked about might show you when you have an indication of it might be possible, but as far as the predictability, it still is not known. Um, anything more than six millimeters uh, is still within the surgical realm, uh, either with a multi-segment Lafort or a SARP, um, if the sutures are totally fused. So uh, to end, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the TAD supported expander uh, now and how this has really affected uh, the way I practice and how you can start incorporating it into your office as well. So with this appliance, um, the reasons that you know I have chosen to use this um, are that it minimizes the tooth tipping uh, because we're going to be we're not anchored to the teeth we're directly anchored to the jaw so that any tooth tipping or damage to the periodontium that may be likely with a bonded or a banded expander on an older kid is going to be minimized. At the same time we can also put all the brackets on at the same time because there's nothing on the teeth preventing us from doing so so that helps us be a lot more clinically efficient with our treatment. We've shown it shows for effective sutural expansion of these older adolescents, uh, wherein the, whereas before this may or may not have been possible, but this is now a tool that we can use to get that sutural expansion, not dental expansion, on those older adolescents. And the older kids, at least in my office, have absolutely loved this because they typically see kids their age um, with Hyrax or Haas expanders, and they say it's a lot of bulk in their mouth. Now with this, their, their bulk is reduced, so it's a lot more comfortable for them, and there's a lot more social acceptance. So there has been very little uh, pushback from any of the kids that we've used uh, having this type of expander versus a conventional one. So the only thing with TAD expanders is you have to remember there is palatal anatomy that you have to be careful of when you're placing palatal TADs. Um, remember that there is an artery here, and that is one area that you have to be uh, on the lookout for when you're placing palatal TADs. Um, there are tons of resources uh, that will talk about TAD placement uh, and TAD placement techniques, uh, which we will not go into here, uh, but we will assume that everybody feels comfortable placing uh, TAD in the palate or can refer to someone who will place them for them. For these TAD supported expanders, um, you can either use four TADs or in some cases two TADs. If you're going to place four TADs, um, I'll tend to place one between the three and the four and then the other uh, between the five and the six. Okay, and then the jack screw goes in between the two sets of screws. In some cases, uh, especially on younger adolescents where less support is needed, uh, two tads can suffice. And if that's the case, I will put them between the four and the five.
So when we're fabricating this expander, um, the one thing to really be on the out lookout for is make sure all the corners are rounded. Because this is strictly going to be supported by the tads on the palate, uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure on the palatal mucosa, and this could dig in if these edges are sharp. So it's very, very important that when this is fabricated, to look at every aspect of it and make sure that every single corner, when you run your finger around it, is rounded and smooth. So when it comes time to actually put it in, um, I actually will make the expander on a blank model. And I will place the tads uh, when, the, when the patient comes in and then retrofit the expander to the tads. I found that's a lot easier to do. And also the kids don't like walking around with tads in the mouth for a week or two uh, on the palate while the expander is being fabricated. So in this case, I used a two tad expander. And I placed the tads in, a, in the mouth. And then I looked at the model and put marks roughly where I placed them. So when I put the expander back on the model, um, I made some marks where the tads are, just so I had a reference position. And then I used, um, in this case, I used the diamond burr to just hollow out the area where the tads are being placed in the mouth. So I did this until I could passively fit the appliance in and out uh, without any feeling any resistance uh, over the tads. So once I got to that point, uh, this took me roughly about three to five minutes of chair time after the tads were placed. I would look and you can see on the model that this hollowed out area is going to be right over where the tads are placed. I then use plastic conditioner uh, or in the absence of plastic conditioner you can use acrylic monomer. Uh, whatever you need to make sure your adhesive stays onto the expander. I paint inside the hollowed out areas and let it dry for a minute. And then I personally use, um, use Bandlock, or you can use any sort of other flowable cement to just fill up that area where the tads are being placed, insert it in the mouth, and light cure. Um, this whole process, like I said, takes me about five minutes of chair time um, after the tads are placed. And then here it is in the mouth. Okay, and now you can begin activating this immediately. So this is the current insertion protocol that we're using. Um, like I said, we fabricate the TAD RPE. Uh, we use an 8 millimeter screw uh, on a blank model. When the day the patient comes in, we place either two or four palatal TADs. I use 1.6 times 8 uh, if I'm going to use two TADs. If I'm going to use four TADs, I'll usually use 8 millimeter on the anterior portion and 6 millimeter in the posterior just because the, um, the mucosa is a lot thinner. I tend to numb up the patient. Uh, I've tried topical anesthetic, but it, um, to me, uh, a couple drops of lidocaine has been a lot more comfortable for the patient, and no one has seemed to object to that. So I place the TADs in, retrofit the RPE to TADs, cement them with bandlock, and then you have a choice. If you want to place brackets that day, you certainly can, um, or you can wait. The thing is, when you activate this, you don't want to place a wire in the upper uh, because you don't want any resistance uh, to the expansion. So I will wait until the expansion is done until I place the upper wire. When we, if we're doing just an expander alone, uh, we will allot, allot 45 minutes um, for the appointment, and that gives us enough time to place the tads, place the expander, and go over instructions and go over expectations. So this is something that fits very easily uh, into the routine of the day and causes minimal disruptions. And like I said, it's a lot more comfortable for our patients. Uh, my expansion protocol uh, is basically two times on the insertion day, once to show the parent, second to have the parent try it themselves. And then we will turn one time a day until the desired expansion is obtained or the screw uh, bottoms out. Okay, and this, uh, this case that was shown is one that followed that protocol. Uh, the left picture was the day of insertion, and the right picture was three weeks later. Now, putting them in is very, very quick. Uh, removing them takes a few minutes. Um, and when it's in, basically what I do is I take a diamond burr or a carbide burr, hollow out around each of the tads, and remove the tads, and the expander will come right out. And then, this, then the palette will heal up uh, roughly in about seven to ten days. So you can use whatever you want. Um, I 
I prefer a Fisher carbide, uh, and I've also uh, started using crown, crown cutting pliers, and that really just goes through the acrylic to grind out the area very well. Um, remove the cement around the tabs, and then you can remove the, either remove the tabs first, and remove the, then remove the expander, or remove the expander and then remove the tabs. It's completely up to you. And then I instruct the patient to rinse with warm salt water for 7 to 10 days, and then it looks like nothing was ever there. So this is what we're typically seeing. Now this is a case of a 15-year-old boy that, using the method that we showed, needed 8 millimeters of expansion. And if you look at the pre- and the post-expansion change, we gained 6 millimeters of bony change with no change in the mandible on a 15-year-old boy. Now this typically would be a case where you would say, oh, that's just, that's not possible to achieve that much. But when we did the measurements, you can see the suture split and how much it changed with very, very, very minimal dental tipping. So this has been the reason that this appliance has been such a bonus to our practice and for our patients is because it's given us that extra tool that we can use to gain our goals uh, of expansion without having to resort to orthognathic surgery. So for a final case example, um, this is Ritu, and when she came in, her measurement need was 9 millimeters. Once again, I want you to look at those posterior teeth and see the extreme inclination of those lower posterior teeth. Okay, No crossbite dentally, skeletal crossbite is present. So if we look at our protocols, uh, she would fall into, that, into this category, needing 9 millimeters of, of uh, expansion, which is two-phase treatment, one early, second one bracketing. And this is exactly what we did. We used a bonded RPE in the first phase, and then we used a tabbed RPE uh, during bracketing. So here she was after phase one. Uh, so we put her braces on, and this is where she was in progress. Now you may say, well, okay, well look, you're able to fit all the you're able to fit all the teeth in. There's no problem. But what I want you to see is that when you look at these canines, how they were coming in, you can see the transverse discrepancy because these upper teeth were now buckily inclined. So what we did is we took out the wire. We put in the TAD RPE and we put the wire back in and you can see how everything now just dropped right into the proper inclination on the top. Okay, and you can see how much we expanded for the second expander. Now, there are a lot of people that may say, well, that's, that's a lot of expansion. The case was overexpanded uh, because there were two expanders. This is where she finished up. And if you look at the goals and compare them to that mucogingival junction, upright, centered, and well intercuspated. This case is not overexpanded. This is exactly what she needed to make the upper and the lower teeth properly fit together. Okay, so we went from this, this original arch form to the final, and look at the change in the inclination now of the posterior teeth and how the upper teeth now properly fit with the bottom. So to recap, this is, this is one of the main points that I want you to take away from. Even if you don't have the ability to use the CBCT method to, to measure the actual expansion, you can look at the inclination of those lower posterior teeth, and this can give you a clinical suspicion if there is possible need for an, for an expander. Then you can kind of go and look at your models and do measurements to see what the true expansion need is. As I said, we showed a method that was using CBCT, uh, there is a method using the dental casts, uh, which are both very simple and accurate ways to diagnose the transverse dimension. There is no need to guess uh, anymore. Uh, if you just go in and do the measurements, you will have a very, very accurate position and accurate understanding of what cases need expansion and which ones don't. And what you're probably going to find is that there's a lot of cases where you would suspect that expansion isn't needed. Actually, there is a discrepancy that's present that you can very easily correct. Uh, if you do the measurements. The current methodology that we're using right now um, is showing that you know expansion effectiveness uh, may start to have a shift uh, in terms of the thought process based on the amount of sutural expansion need, the sutural maturity, the vertical placement of the screw, as well as now the appliance type that you use. You said with the TAD, TAD expander versus a conventional expander,
we are seeing differences in the amount of sutural expansion, and that's based on what we use depends on what need the patients have. And finally, the TAD-supported RPEs, uh, as I've shown, uh, at least in our practice, are a very effective alternative for the expansion uh, in older adolescents. So thank you very much uh, for uh, participating in this webinar. Um, once again, this is myself, uh, Ryan Tamburino. I have a partner, Shalene Shaw, and we practice together uh, in Princeton, uh, New Jersey, and in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, I'd like to thank um, GAC uh, for sponsoring this webinar, uh, as well as the Cl Complete Clinical Orthodontics um, series. And I could not, could not do this without the help of Catapult Group, uh, which arranged the webinar and provided uh, fantastic uh, support throughout this process. So thank you, and have a good day.